back. Finally, it got so that he just couldn't seem to bend over to put his socks on and shoes. And no way had I ever thought that this bake hall was doing this. He took it October, November, and December, he was gone. He should have never, never died. Lucy Archer's husband died more than five months after Bayer had strong indications their drug might be less safe than Lipitor. Although the company hasn't acknowledged any wrongdoing, Bayer paid an undisclosed amount to settle a lawsuit brought by the widow of David Archer. Although Bayer has won a few jury trials in cases where it was unclear that Baycall caused the damage, the company has settled more than 1,200 lawsuits and paid over $430 million to victims. Beyond the harm done to individuals, though, the Baycall story reveals how dependent the FDA is on information supplied by drug companies. The FDA is wholly dependent on trust, on trusting that the company is providing all the truth all the time. That the company is not hiding information, that the company is not covering up information, that the company is not changing information. Dr. Leo Lutwak, a retired FDA drug reviewer, says reliance on companies was central to the biggest disaster in the agency's history, the Fenfen tragedy, in which two FDA-approved weight loss drugs injured tens of thousands of Americans. Lutwak struggled within the agency to keep those drugs out of consumers' hands. I felt it was an open and shut case. This was a dangerous group of drugs with very little, if any, benefit and that they should be immediately removed from the market, removed from use, discontinued, disappear. Well, that didn't happen, I became disturbed. I became concerned about the system. I became concerned about the drug company's role in this. And I was particularly concerned with the potential effect on the thousands of millions of people who would be using the drug. What was particularly shocking to me was that on the heels of reporting that this drug caused a fatal incurable disease in Europe that the company was planning to put it on the American marketplace. Um, when I had heard this I said well you can try but it's never going to get in this country. The FDA would never permit a drug that had little benefit, terrible risk on the American marketplace. The FDA is your watchdog that looks out for your safety. FDA reviewer Lutwak also believed the agency would not approve the drug. According to what I read and the way I interpreted the Food and Drug Administration's role, we're supposed to evaluate drugs for their safety and efficacy. The drug companies that were seeking to sell Redox also got a turn to speak. They presented data showing that some patients lost a lot of weight and argued that for society as a whole, Obesity was more harmful than any side effects. Eventually, the 11 committee members had to come up with a recommendation, which the FDA could either accept or ignore. The FDA sided with Wyeth. People at the company were jubilant. Leo Lutwak was devastated. I thought it was wrong that the company was allowed to uh, have a second chance at the advisory committee. I thought there were wrong decisions made. I expressed that. I started feeling enough heat to make me recognize that my opinions were not only not respected, but they would be disregarded and pushed out of the picture. The number of people hired at the agency to protect, to analyze data on drug safety is criminal. Dr. Woosley was a top candidate to head up the FDA last year and believes safety should be a much higher priority at the agency. The teams that are needed to do drug safety are infinitely more than what they've got right now. We don't have a safety system in this country. The Congress has repeatedly looked at how it wants to fund the FDA. And so once, twice, and again last year, the Congress decided that the best way to fund the FDA was to look to the pharmaceutical industry to provide a portion of the funds to help support review. That's the decision of the Congress.
Another alarming issue is meat safety. We all trust our lives to the USDA and meat production companies to keep us safe from E. coli and salmonella. Deadly bacteria. In the early 1990s, a deadly outbreak of E. coli at Jack in the Box killed a dozen or more people, including several children. This forced the USDA to reevaluate its inspection practices. What was found was that in 1993, the USDA was still using meat inspection procedures which haven't been updated since 1906. This means the meat you were eating was determined safe by using the poke and sniff method. How was this allowed to happen? The beef industry lobby, that's how. Thus, the USDA imposed stricter biological testing regulations. But the beef industry put up a big fight. Just recently, one of the country's largest producers of hamburger, Supreme Beef, was cited for several deadly violations of salmonella contamination. Instead of cleaning up their operation or change their practices, Supreme Beef sued the USDA trying to say that meat contaminated with salmonella was safe. Three times, Supreme Beef, a hamburger meat grinding plant in Texas, failed a series of tests for salmonella contamination once with nearly 50% of its meat contaminated. Instead of complying with the new standards, they sued the USDA. And this wasn't just any ground beef plant. This was a ground beef plant that was supplying as much as 45% of the meat for the national school lunch program. I mean, this meat was going to be sold and served to kids. That there are hundreds or even thousands of animals that have contributed to a single hamburger. The story of this pathogen, though, really illustrates the ecological um, links between the health of these animals and the health of us. When you bring everything together and you make it really big and you mix up microbes from all these different places in the feedlot and then in the hamburger and then it spans out to you know, millions of people, that's a petri dish for, for uh, food poisoning. The Supreme Beef suit was supported by the National Meat Association and the American Meat Institute. AMI's Patrick Boyle says there was a principle involved. Salmonella on a raw, uncooked product is not, in and of itself, a public health risk. The Salmonella performance standard has no scientific underpinnings. It has no relevance in terms of the, the wholesomeness of the product or the cleanliness of the facility. What I really don't understand about Patrick Boyle's argument is that 95 to 98 percent of the plants tested for salmonella passed on the first test. Everybody in the industry passed this test. Why is Patrick Boyle defending the bottom dwellers who would take no steps to meet a standard that wasn't very high. Why is he defending them? If your goal is to, as you said, to improve the, the quality and the safety of the meat, why fight this case? The, the goal is to produce safe product in clean facilities. We do that. What the court concluded is that just because you have salmonella in raw, uncooked ground beef in no way suggests as a raw, uncooked product that it's adulterated or that the, plants that the plant that's producing it is insanitary. But the new testing system also revealed new problems. As the regulations went into effect, the amount of contaminated meat that had to be recalled rose dramatically. Last year alone, the USDA reported 163 recalls for microbial contamination, totaling over 100 million pounds of meat. IBP is recalling nearly 300,000 pounds of ground beef this morning. Some of the beef may have been contaminated with E. coli bacteria. The beef was shipped to at least 19 states, and most of it may already have been consumed. But many worry there are flaws in the recall system. Believe it or not, in this modern world, the USDA, which is the regulatory authority, cannot order the recall of contaminated meat from around the country. The government does not have mandatory recall authority. USDA, in their hundred years of regulating uh, the meat industry, cannot point to a single instance where, at their suggestion, a company refused to initiate a voluntary recall. But they delay. And if you say, I got ground beef, and somebody says, 
Yeah, how do you know? How much do I have to recall? How do you know it was that lot and this lot? And you delay five days or six days, 30% of it's gone. And the company never gets that back. Somebody ate it, and they got paid for it. A recent study by the federal government shows that when a recall is issued, on average, less than 25% of the meat is ever recovered, leading many to say that government needs mandatory recall authority. In most cases, the food industry will do it because the USDA will go out and do a press release and saying this product is contaminated with E. coli or salmonella and we want it back and then the companies will act as fast as they can to do that because if they don't, they're nuts. They're, they face bankruptcy, total liability. But in some cases, it's harder for them to do this than it is for the government just with its resources. So it's a big gap in the law. And you can see now if you had food that was, let's say, contaminated with bioterrorism uh, or some sort of nefarious activity, you'd want the government to have the power to order the recall of contaminated food. One of the technologies the industry is pushing is irradiation. They believe it would ensure the safety of ground beef from almost all pathogens. We're serving meatballs out of Luigi, which are irradiated for your safety and to take care of the microbes inside. Irradiation is probably the most tested food process in history. We take the meat that we use for our meatballs for a short period of time, expose it to a little bit of radiant energy. It attacks the microbes that are lurking inside the meat, making it perfectly safe. Some consumers and retailers and frankly some beef companies are concerned about the market response to that technology. But today there are only two steps or technologies that we know will eliminate E. coli in beef. And that's cooking it properly when we handle the food or irradiating it before we purchase the food. I'm not opposed to irradiating ground beef. Um, if I were supplying a nursing home, I'd probably make sure that the meat came in irradiated. My concern is that I don't want a system that says you can have fecal matter all over it and then irradiate it. Irradiated poop won't make you sick, but it's still poop. We won't eat filthy meat. We won't eat. In December, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in favor of Supreme Beef, saying the USDA could not shut down a plant solely based on the salmonella tests. Test the meat or we won't eat! This last week, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals gutted the nation's meat safety laws like a slaughterhouse guts a steer. Test and tell! Test and tell! The Fifth Circuit Court's ruling, I just think, pounded another nail into my son's coffin in its ruling supporting the industry's lawsuit against the United States Department of Agriculture. It basically states that it's okay to ship the public salmonella-laced burgers. And I just find that to be just incredibly, incredibly discouraging in this day and age when we should be moving forward with food safety um, and, and strengthening the safety of our food. Instead, we're taking a giant step backward. Filthy meat kills! None of us really know how safe the meat supply is. We do know that there's still 76 million cases of foodborne illness every year, 325,000 hospitalizations and 5,000 deaths. So the meat supply may be safer than it was 10 years ago, but it sure isn't safe enough. Now what happens to the rest of the animal parts and remains that we don't eat? Well, most people think, well, they make dog food or animal food out of it. Well, think again. They take the rest of the animal remains, the heads, the bones, the organs, the skin, the fur, the feet, etc., and throw it into a big vat. Then they grind it and break it down with acids and boil it down to a gigantic mush. Then they dry and chemically bleach it and market to the food and supplement industries under 16 different names. The most popular names are hydrolyzed collagen and gelatin. And guess what? They put it back in your foods as well as a number of skincare creams, scrubs, and soaps. They take collagen and gelatin and use it as a so-called protein additive in popular health bars and countless weight loss products, as well as jello, snack foods, puddings, and a number of instant desserts. They call it hydrolyzed collagen or gelatin or a protein blend. Just read the label. 
It's like picking a dead animal off the road and then grinding up the skin, the fur, the bones, the claws, the teeth, the cartilage, and the flesh and boiling it down into a big mush and then add food coloring, sugar, and refrigerate it. Would you eat that? Well, guess what? You already have. And so many people continue to eat it each and every day and don't have a clue. Now, here's something else you should be concerned about. Throughout history, there's been a pattern of misdirection when it comes to the truth about foodborne illness. What most people don't realize is this. The meat industry has been repeatedly challenged and exposed for erroneous, fallacious, misinformed, misguided, and misdirected accusations designed to attack nuts, seeds, grains, fruits, and vegetables. So that the public puts their focus away from bad meat and onto plant-based whole foods whenever there's an outbreak of foodborne illness. Once the investigation has been done, these plant-based whole foods have always been vindicated. Do you remember the apple juice scare in the late 80s? How about the beef industry's attack of soybeans in the late 90s? And here in the 21st century, blueberries were attacked. And even today, green onions, so-called scallions, have come under attack for hepatitis. Well, here's the truth. Plant-based whole foods cannot naturally produce deadly bacteria such as salmonella, E. coli, hepatitis, or listeria. These deadly bacteria only come from animal urine and feces. They can only come from meat. So the only way plant-based whole foods can become contaminated with these types of deadly bacteria is to come in contact with the preparation surfaces, utensils, and people's hands, which have already been contaminated by the tainted meat itself. So the next time you hear about an outbreak of foodborne illness, and they say it's coming from some fruit, vegetable, nut, seed, or legume, think again. It's not the plant-based whole foods. It's the meat. Aspartame is a very common chemical sweetener that is used in thousands of products that we consume every day. The controversial additive has been studied for years. What most people don't know about aspartame is this. When aspartame is heated above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, it converts into two deadly chemicals, formaldehyde and formic acid. Formaldehyde is what they use to embalm dead people, and formic acid is the chemical found in the sting of the fire ant. The manufacturers are so smart, they make sure aspartame is not poison before you eat it, so it will pass the FDA guidelines. But after you consume it, aspartame changes into deadly chemicals. Mind you, it might be in very low doses at first, but if you consume it for years on end, it will eventually catch up with you. Once again, why haven't we been told? Where's the warning? Out of 90 independently funded studies, 83 of them found that one or more health problems were caused by aspartame. All of the studies funded by the aspartame industry claim that no problems were found. The 83 unbiased studies also concluded that aspartame by far is the most dangerous additive on the market today. Aspartame accounts for 75% of the adverse reactions of food additives reported to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Many of these reactions are very serious, including seizures and death, as disclosed in a February 1994 Department of Health and Human Services report. Here are just a few of the 90 different documented symptoms listed in the report as being caused by aspartame. They include headaches, migraines, seizures, numbness, weight gain, depression, insomnia, hearing loss, breathing difficulties, slurred speech, tinnitus, memory loss, dizziness, nausea, muscle spasms, rashes, fatigue, vision problems, heart palpitations, anxiety attacks, loss of taste, vertigo, and joint pain. According to researchers and physicians studying the adverse effects of aspartame, the following chronic illnesses can be triggered or worsened by ingesting aspartame. Brain tumors, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, mental retardation, birth defects, multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue syndrome, Alzheimer's, lymphoma, fibromyalgia, and diabetes. It has also been reported that many pilots appear to be particularly susceptible to the effects of aspartame ingestion. They have reported numerous toxicity effects, including grand mal seizures in the cockpit. Nearly 1,000 cases of pilot reactions have been reported to the Aspartame Consumer Safety Network Pilot Hotline. The susceptibility may be related to ingesting aspartame at high altitudes. And the questions that so many ask are, how can this be happening right under our noses? Why haven't we been told? Toxicity also finds its way into our bodies through other products we use every day, from toothpaste, deodorants, shampoos, 
soaps, skin creams, lotions, cosmetics, colognes, and perfumes. We use these products day in and day out, week after week, month after month, year after year. We start at a young age and continue from there. But all these toxins found in these types of products are getting into our bodies, and they can cause adverse health effects. Science has now confirmed that many toxic chemicals are being absorbed into our bodies in measurable amounts, and it's starting to pose big questions. And body of evidence, a new study finds a surprising amount of pollution in people. Should we worry? From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening. Scientists have been studying chemical contamination in our air, land, and water for a long time, but now some are beginning to ask questions about the contamination in our bodies from products that we use every day. NBC's Robert Hager tonight on a new study, a small start, that is raising big questions. When scientists sampled Andrea Martin's blood and urine to see what toxins she'd picked up from the world around her, she got a surprise. I had 95 chemical contaminants in my little body, and it was very mind-blowing. Martin and eight others were tested by Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York and an advocacy organization called the Environmental Working Group. The results indicate from everyday products we handle in our homes and offices and from the air, food, and water, we all pick up an astounding number of chemicals that are known to be dangerous, but only in larger doses. On average, the nine had traces of 53 chemicals known to cause cancer in human or animal tests, 62 toxic to the brain or nervous system, and 55 associated with birth defects. They didn't find any single substance in amounts the government labels unhealthy, but said the sheer number and uncertainty about trace amounts was unnerving. Irrefutable proof that humans carry in their bodies scores of industrial contaminants, most of which didn't exist. 75 years ago. Scientists have found phylates that cause birth defects in animals in items like makeup, hairspray, and food wraps. Other chemicals target the nervous system. Synthetic fragrances in perfume and soap, acetone in nail polish removers, poisons in weed killers and bug sprays, and perchloroethylene in dry cleaners. In paint, there's organ-damaging xylene. But some manufacturers today call the study hype. Jay Broom has a firm that deals with pesticides. I think it was an attempt to be more alarmist than is necessary uh, and uh, sort of overinflate the message and the facts. But for those intent on avoiding even traces of toxic chemicals, the study's authors suggest eating organic produce, minimizing fatty foods, chemicals concentrated in fat, minimizing use of beauty products, avoiding stain removers, and seafood known to be high in mercury like canned tuna. Maybe more caution than many care to take, but the scientists say it is amazing how much gets in our bodies. Robert Hager, NBC News, Washington. And here we are, the richest, most prosperous nation in the world, with the sickliest generation and more chronic disease than any time in our history. Millions are suffering and being treated for chronic conditions that are completely preventable and curable. Follow the money. Each year, billions in profits are made by prescribing medications that treat these chronic conditions, yet they do not cure. The big food and health care pharmaceutical lobbies have significant influence over government officials and the medical community. They have very deep pockets which allow them to fund medical schools, medical associations like the ADA, and donate millions to research and the training of doctors. They spend millions on a new pill, and then they lobby and strong-arm government officials and agencies for drug approval. Once approved, their stock goes up and the profits continue. What would happen if these huge industries shifted their focus from treating symptoms to prevention and cures? What would happen if they found a way to cure cancer, AIDS, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, allergies, asthma, acid reflux? A $100 trillion income for the food, pharmaceutical, and drug companies would disappear. In order to maintain their profitability, they must create medications that prolong the conditions we suffer from by suppressing and controlling our symptoms. Addressing the root cause of disease would be business suicide. Instead, they spend countless millions on advertising, which continues us to believe that spending hundreds of dollars, sometimes thousands per month on pills and taking them forever is normal. And they've done it. As a nation, we've been conditioned to believe that chronic health conditions like diabetes and acid reflux are just part of life, that they're as natural as rain, 
and that we should be thankful for our pills. The reality is that we've been conditioned to believe that lifeless foods and lifeless artificially colored popping and fizzing drinks are going to energize us. We take the combo meal, then we supersize it. Extra fake cheese, please. Hot dogs, greasy french fries, poppers, burgers, pizza, partially hydrogenated chips and snacks, and extremely saturated animal fats and trans fats and processed sugars. All of this aggressive, misleading mass advertising has caused a paradigm shift, especially in our children. The understanding of what is healthy has been effectively distorted. To kids, cool is healthy, and this has resulted in dangerous conditioning and very bad habits. Kids and adults alike have been conditioned to buy the look of the product, and emotionally, they're eating the look of the product. The majority of kids today don't drink enough water, and if it wasn't for french fries, they'd hardly eat any vegetables at all. They consume hundreds, even thousands of sugary, lifeless foods and drinks every day. And the introduction of video games and home entertainment keeps them from exercise. That's why, according to Newsweek magazine, in July of 2000, there were 6 million children seriously overweight. And just recently as August 2003, that number has reached 9 million. This is a tragedy. So then we give our children harmful medications to suppress the symptoms and continue to allow them to consume the chemical-laden, lifeless foods and drinks, which fuels the condition, which becomes chronic. This was almost unheard of in a child as recently as 50 years ago. These huge companies discovered that customers create an emotional attachment to the look of the food, and they know how to trigger our impulses on command with TV, radio, the internet, billboards, product packaging, colorful signs, and neon lights. The advertisers realized if we see something enough times, in just the right way, or we see our favorite celebrity using the product, we can be conditioned to believe that the product is good and it becomes part of our belief system at a core level. By combining this type of powerful conditioning with false messages about food and health, big business has created the situation that we're in today. One big business conditions us to eat our way to chronic illness. Then another big business sells us the pills to keep us alive and ease our pains. What nature has to offer is something different. It's simple yet profound. Plenty of water, a little sunshine, a little walking, and fresh whole foods. And stop using toxic personal care products and switch to natural soaps, shampoos, toothpaste, and skin creams. And once again, there's no warning labels or dangerous side effects with nature's prescription. When you combine water with whole food, you open the door to a wonderful world of benefits to your body. The voice of reason is here. It's even making its way into some of the latest research. In November 1998, Newsweek magazine quoted Dr. Mitchell Gaynor, head of the oncology at New York Strain Cancer Center, who said, we've seen the future of medicine, and the future is food. The new Mayo Clinic food pyramid shows that fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and whole grains should make up the largest part of your diet. Those who eat a lot of fruit tend to have less cancer and fewer health problems. Time magazine is now showing us how food fights and prevents cancer. Fruits, vegetables are loaded with antioxidants and phytochemicals, which protect cell from DNA damage. Omega-3 fatty acids, nuts, and seeds help thwart tumor growth. Soy helps protect reproductive tissues from cancer. Grapes cut off the blood supply to cancer cells. Let food be your medicine. Whole foods contain flavonoids, indoles, beta-carotenes, lutenes, lycopenes, and isoflavins. Living phytochemicals are the one-two punch against cancer and obesity, and they're not found in any pill or supplement contrary to pseudoscience or sales campaigns. The latest discoveries about the benefits of whole food show that chili peppers soothe toothaches, calm asthma coughs, and respiratory ailments. They are nature's decongestant and they support healthy food digestion as well. Selenium is a cancer knockout. Selenium reduces the reoccurrence of prostate cancer by 69%, colon rectal cancer by 64%, and lung cancer by 34%. And the best source of selenium is in your grocery store, Brazil nuts. Raisins help control blood sugar levels. Dates reduce prostate cancer by up to 30%. Cashews are a natural antidepressant. Tomatoes contain lycopenes and phytonutrients that is good for your heart and blood. Walnuts are pure brain food and increase neurotransmitter function. Blueberries help restore short-term memory loss and balance motor skill function. Oats and whole grains reduce bad cholesterol levels and help lower blood pressure. Peanuts are nature's Viagra. Raspberries, strawberries, and other berries contain high amounts of antioxidants, which reduce the risk of cell DNA damage, which causes cancer. Bananas are high in potassium and great for male sexual function, 
Avocados are heart-healthy fats and are proven to promote and protect the health of female reproductive organs. Grapes enhance red and white blood cell function. All fruits and vegetables and nuts are high in fiber and promote healthy digestion and assimilation. Carrots are high in carotenes, which promote healthy vision, and the list goes on and on and on. But can you get all of this from a vitamin pill or from supplements? The herbal 